Good afternoon. My name is Leandra Clark. I'm a fourth year doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm at the Association of Black Psychologists 40th Annual Convention. It's August 4th, 2008, and I have the distinct honor of interviewing Dr. Anderson J. Franklin. Dr. Franklin, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. So I want to start off the interview by asking you a little bit about where you're from, um, where you grew up, where you're born. Uh, I'm a Brooklyn boy. Okay. Born and raised in in, in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. uh, my father was a pastor of a, a large and prominent church, so I grew up in the in the church. Mm -hmm. um, we grew that church from a small, uh, what we call on the hill, little storefront to. Um, uh, over 4,000 members. Wow. Um, and so I grew up observing all of the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the history of black people and church mm -hmm. experience completely wow. during my childhood. So being a PK, <laughs> how did this influence um, your early educational pursuits and aspirations? Well, two levels. Mm -hmm. One was that my father was very much a part of the uh, community activist ministers uh, at that time, and in fact was one of the ministers that Branch Rickey uh, convened uh, in preparation of introducing Jackie Robinson to the Dodgers. Wow. So I have that distinct um, family history and um, work of my father. So he laid the groundwork in terms of social activism, community mm -hmm. work, and community leadership. So tell me more about the Community Activist Ministers group. Actually, there's a book called The Black uh, Brooklyn Black Clergy in the 40s mm -hmm. and the 50s, and the uh, activism of um, Reverend Dr. Gardner Taylor, Sandy Gray, uh, my father, Reverend Claude L. Franklin. He was the Brooklyn C.L. Mm -hmm. Franklin and Rita Franklin's uh, father was the Detroit C.L. Franklin. Oh my goodness. Um, and he was very much involved in the um, both the local ministerial as well as the national ministerial conferences. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that particular ministerial group in the 40s and the 50s were very instrumental with uh, making Brooklyn a home for the number of blacks who were migrating mm -hmm. up from the south during that time. Mm -hmm. So. Both my parents are from the South, my father's from Mississippi, my mother's family is from Virginia. Wow. But the church community was nothing but the South. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have, we would set up having uh, uh, different clubs, the North Carolina Club, the South Carolina Club, and they would have barbecues and raise money and everything. So um, mm -hmm. my experience was a Brooklyn experience, but it was also very much a Southern experience. Mm -hmm. with, yeah, definitely. In that kind of culture. So it sounds like the church kind of sustained you during your youth. Oh, absolutely. Up. Yeah, absolutely. And um, tell me about your early educational experiences. What kind of student were you? What was it like? Um, well, you know, I guess I was the average student because I was busy uh, in my early childhood playing baseball and <laughs> uh, basketball and more focused on uh, athletics. Mm -hmm. I was on, uh, you know, basketball team and high school team and uh, running track and doing those kinds of things and not paying as much attention to um, uh, the uh, academics, so to speak. And I also sang. Wow. So one of the, and I was a musician uh, playing the violin and the piano. Very but talented. <laughs> throughout my uh, youth, um, <laughs> one of the things I did was to sing in the church choir uh, sang in the high school glee club mm -hmm. and then ultimately in the university choir. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the messages about education that you received um, as a high school student, as a young person growing up in this um, environment? Uh, the message was very loud and clear from my mother and father. Okay. <laughs> there was absolutely no question, you know, you were going to go to college and you were going to succeed and you, you, know, you not only were doing this uh, for the family, mm. uh, but you were, you know, your, your success was very much uh, a comment on the community. So mm. you represented not only the family, but also the community in your achievements. A lot of pressure. 
a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to say the least. So were there messages about what um, you should pursue as far as majors or programs or anything like that? Well, my father being a minister, all ministers want their children to be ministers. I'm if, a PK myself. If you're a PK, then mm -hmm. you know that message is, <laughs> <laughs> I do. is loud and clear. So I grew up around a lot of PKs. Yeah. Uh, went to the greatest PK school, so to speak, the Virginia Union University, okay. which uh, produced a, you know, a lot of prominent um, ministers uh, in the past. My father went to uh, Virginia Union, so mm. we, my brother and I are second generation there. Mm -hmm. So you did go to Virginia Union? Well, we, yeah, we <laughs> did go. <laughs> so I sang at the uh, university choir for four years and many of the ministers across the country mm. today I know uh, because they either went through Virginia Union or mm -hmm. you know, part of that network. Wow. So that's where you went for college and then what happened after Virginia Union? Went to Howard, got my okay. master's in um, um, psychology. Um, I would say Virginia Union, uh, just to go back a minute, helped yeah, to sure. solidify sort of my community commitment because hmm. um, I was there uh, at the time that, um, and actually was Virginia Union was the in Richmond, the second uh, school and the first in the state of Virginia uh, to conduct the sit-ins right after the um, uh, sit-in movement started. So a month after what happened wow. in Greensboro, mm -hmm. um, we were involved in demonstrating downtown in the city of Richmond, which was highly segregated uh, at that time. And I was a part of that whole group of uh, the undergraduates. So I went, you know, uh, throughout the days of demonstration. Some of that is all on eyes and the prize. Mm -hmm. And um, was the fourth person arrested, you know, and um, wow. sent to jail. And uh, then got you know, taken out of jail, and the Ku Klux Klan you know, put us on there. How long were you in jail? List. Well, we weren't in jail that long, mm -hmm. you know, for the day. You know, mm -hmm. And it took a time for the NAACP at that time to get us out of jail. And then you said you were on the wanted list for the. Oh well, yeah, they sent us little notes up to the campus, and then you know we created a lot of problems for. Um, the then president was the distinguished uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel De DeWitt Proctor, mm -hmm. you know, who ultimately became uh, the senior pastor of that senior Baptist church. Mm -hmm. So they were none too happy with us at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you were causing a lot of problems. We were causing you a few problems. You weren't being good PKs at all. No, we weren't being mm -hmm. good PKs. Wow. So about 30 of us ended up getting um, arrested and then we had a whole trial and it just sort of turned over the whole city of Richmond and then uh, Lynchburg and they had to started having mm -hmm. student sit-ins mm -hmm. um, in other uh, locales throughout mm -hmm. Virginia. So how did you get through college with everything that was going on with all the um, eruption the, the chaos how did you make it through? Well, one of the things about HBCUs they uh, were really family you mm -hmm. know um, and you, you had tremendous amount of support. Uh, the message was loud and clear, and it underscored all our parents' uh, message, which was that you were going to get an education. <laughs> and in, in spite of the segregation and the racism, uh, that's nothing to deter you. Mm -hmm. you know, that uh, you still had the capacity, uh, if you study hard, if you apply yourself, uh, to be um, whatever you want to be. So did you feel like you had good um, models of success around you during that time? Oh, sure. You had some of the brightest um, faculty, mm -hmm. uh, black faculty yeah. you know, in the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. Henry J. McGuinn, was mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the early black sociologists and brilliant man. Yeah and um, was a great inspiration. And that was my first degree, by the way, was in sociology. My major was sociology. Mm -hmm. And I subsequently uh, got a double major in psychology. But psychology wasn't a degree offered very much in HCBUs when I mm -hmm. um, was going mm -hmm. to college. Howard had a psychology department, but so not too many other institutions yeah. really had a psychology department. Because sociology was really the discipline mm -hmm. 
um, for the study of social issues. Okay. So is that what attracted you to Howard? The fact that they had this psych to program? Howard? Mm -hmm. Well, Howard had the psychology department, right. and I knew that um, that was one of the places where I could strengthen my undergraduate training mm -hmm. as well as uh, get a master's degree, so I was right. able to do that. Okay, all right. And then um, what happened after Howard? Well, you know, we had some giants at Howard. We had Leslie Hicks and, uh, and James Payton and uh, Carolyn Payton, so they, you know that, that helped to reinforce um, my passion for the field because I had black role models right. um, who were in the field. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, Carolyn Payton was my men mentor. Wow. And she became the first uh, black uh, head of the Peace Corps mm -hmm. and uh, then came back to Howard as director uh, of, of counseling there and was uh, continued to be prominent in the field. So I had a lot of uh, great black role models. And then yeah. after Howard, I ran into uh, another uh, good role model and leader in the name of Charles Thomas. Uh, and Charles Thomas was at the University of Oregon where I started my doctoral program in counseling psychology. He was there my first year, um, being the only black professor there. Right. Uh, you know, I bonded with him, mm -hmm. uh, being traumatized by <laughs> the environment of Oregon at the time I yeah. went there. And, you know, still coming out of the, um, uh, very much the civil rights mm -hmm. movement at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I had been involved in work in, actually, there was a Center for Youth and Community Studies in Stokely Carmichael, and um, um, uh, the future mayor of, uh, of Washington, D.C., can't remember his name right now, who's yeah. part of SNCC. All, yeah. all of uh, folks were around wow. campus at that time talking about, you know, going down to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and so it was uh, the 60s, that's yeah. about the best way to sum it up. So you finished your time at Oregon? Finished your time at Oregon. Um, uh, in uh, in 1968, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, that summer, uh, at the same year that ABCI was born, mm -hmm. I was uh, on my way to uh, Nigeria, moving my family mm -hmm. um, to uh, Nigeria to take a lectureship at the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Wow. Uh, Charles Thomas uh, was writing me letters telling me about this new and exciting group that he and Robert Green and Joe White and you know, <laughs> just went down the list of names of people had uh, convened, convened at the uh, APA convention and started the Association of Black Psychologists. So he was sending me letters to in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I um, uh, re returned to the country for, it was during the summer mm -hmm. of, of 69 for a brief time. And it was during the convention, he told me I needed to come down to uh, uh, join the uh, meeting of the Association of Black Psychologists because at that time it was being held uh, jointly when the American Psychological mm. Association and it was still a, a newly forming group. Mm -hmm. That's where I met uh, Bob Williams and Reginald Jones and, wow. um, and the Hilliards, Asa and Tom. Wow. So it was, uh, it was quite exciting and I think it was that year in 69 um, was when you know, a group of us marched on the uh, Council of Representatives or some meeting being held by the APA Executive Board to uh, uh, protest the lack of mm -hmm. representation of the black experience in psychology, uh, the lack of representation of the black experience on panels. Right. And, you know, at the convention mm -hmm. at, at all, and kind of shut that whole meeting down. Yes, I've heard the story. Yeah. And so, so you were a part of that. Yeah, I was wow. tagging along in that. Oh yeah. my goodness, wow. So um, how did your involvement in ABCI evolve? Um, I hear that you were involved as a student and, and getting exposed to it, and as you graduated and you went on in your career, um, what did you do in ABCI? Um, when I came back, moved back to the uh, States after you know, living in Africa, uh, we started forming the New York chapter. Mm. Um, and I guess that's 
one of the areas I made my greatest contribution to ABCI. I became president of the uh, New York chapter about 72, 71, 72, mm -hmm. um, and was president for almost three years. Um, we wow. formed, you know, a student network. I guess one of the major accomplishments we did was to provide support for uh, black students uh, in the doctoral programs throughout the greater New York metropolitan mm -hmm. area. So New York ABCI developed this strong student support in which um, uh, Craig Polite, Dr. Craig Polite, you know, the Curis set up a dissertation seminar mm -hmm. because one of the difficulties at that time was for black students in these uh, doctoral programs to find mentors and advisors who were willing to take up dissertation topics focused on the black experience. Mm -hmm. you know and uh, the different paradigms that we were suggesting and mm -hmm. uh, were not being accepted, much less approved by the faculty. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue was that uh, uh, students were being challenged in terms of comprehensive exams and mm -hmm. finishing and completing. Mm -hmm. So we had a group of us that would, um, you know, led by, by me, uh, uh, at that point Bill Lyles was uh, a major part of it, William, uh, William uh, Bill Hall, William Hall, and uh, also Vera Pasta, wow. and a number of us would go and meet with the chairs of the different psychology departments about the uh, status of, um, of ABCI members. Did you feel heard? Did you feel accepted? Oh, yeah, a number of them were um, trying to be responsive. It depended upon the program, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and the person yeah. uh, as to how much they would be responsive. And then it was a tough situation because you know, students were taking a risk for bringing ABCI into the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the government's, governance issues of a particular department or training. And they were still in the program, so we didn't know what uh, kind of backlash. Yeah. So that created a host of other issues for us, which is that we had to continue to monitor the progress of students. Mm -hmm. And so what was the result? Did these students get through? Well, and you got a through? generation of students yeah. out here who were, you know, finished. So you were very instrumental. Um, you know, like to think so, yeah. It's mm, amazing. And then at the national level, how have you been involved in the national organization? It's been coming, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, every, every year. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on different committees. Um, yeah. uh, there was a time there when I was involved with the um, licensing board in, mm. in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, Joe White, Guy Seymour, and myself ran for a number of years uh, workshops and seminars for ABCI to help um, you know create a a really a, a, a ability to help ABCI members to gain uh, their national and uh, their state licenses for mm -hmm. psychology. So there was a certification and license panel. Then mm -hmm. we had the committee on testing. Wow. And I was, you know, part, part of the committee too. on tests. Yeah. Wow. So, Dr. Franklin, what do you do today? I mean, you told me all these great experiences, all the things you've done, and, and you're still working. I'm still working. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Actually, I retired from, after 30 years, uh, as a professor mm -hmm. uh, in the clinical psychology doctoral program at the City University of New York mm -hmm. um, uh, to accept uh, an endowed chair and distinguished professorship at Boston College. Oh. So I now hold the uh, uh, distinguished title of the Honorable David S. Nelson Professor of Psychology and Education wow. at Boston College, Lynch School of Education. Mm -hmm. I'm in the same department now, counseling psychology mm -hmm. faculty as um, Janet Helms. Yeah. Very exciting. So I'm, I have the opportunity to continue uh, my own work. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my work is on black males, mm -hmm. uh, my own theory about the invisibility syndrome, mm -hmm. which uh, builds on Ralph Ellison's and thesis in The Invisible Man. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's get to talking about your works on uh, black males and black families, too. Um, well, for uh, a while I've been t talking about the um, sort of psychological consequences mm -hmm. uh, for black men in particular um, that comes from the imposition of stereotypes and constantly being 
uh, misrepresented mm -hmm. uh, and essentially made invisible by all, all the assumptions and presumptions that people have of us and what happens clinically, emotionally, mm -hmm. uh, psychologically you know, to the man as they, you know, we go through this every day mm -hmm. and essentially have to live our entire lives with this particular challenge. And you know how do men become self-reliant hmm. uh, and succeed in spite of that? How do we become fathers? Um, I, you know, how how do men who are good fathers are able to sustain yeah. their self-concept and self-image mm -hmm. with all the negative press that that goes on? You know, and that's another example of hmm. being invisible and what psychological toll that takes. Yeah. So I you know, have been doing a lot of clinical work over my 30 mm -hmm. years of my life has been involved in either teaching clinical mm -hmm. supervision, uh, 30 years of private practice. Wow. Uh, working with, um, I have like, had a huge practice and about half of my practice have been involved in working with men and for about 16 years I ran therapeutic support groups for black men. Mm -hmm. So, most of my writings and my last book from Brotherhood to Manhood mm -hmm. helps to represent in greater detail those kinds of issues. So, considering all of your experience, um, clinical and um, academic, um, what is your advice to clinicians who are treating black families, specifically um, working with black males? What, what advice would you give? Uh, don't become uh, a victim of mm. the uh, the press that pushes certain stereotypes and assumptions mm -hmm. about black men. Um, uh, you sort of don't judge a person by the public press. Mm -hmm. Judge a person by what they they share with you in terms of their life and understand them within their life frame, not within your life assumptions. And it sounds so simple. It is simple, <laughs> but racism creates some mm -hmm. ugly creatures out there. That's right. Wow. So in closing, I'm wondering if you could share um, just actually your thoughts about the future of the Association of Black Psychologists. Um, we're at our 40 year point now, we're 40 years old, and what are some of your hopes for the future? I'm 40 years older. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> What are your hopes for the future of ABSI? Well, my hopes uh, are, are right in front of me, like you and uh, the, the younger generation uh, that um, will keep the banner high. Okay. Um, the mission and goals of, of ABSI yeah. and be, you know, responsive to the changing times, the new yeah. millennium. Uh, you know, I don't know what 20 or 40 years from now life will be. I do know that even in spite of the progress, that there are still many, many things that haven't changed. That's so, true. Uh, so the work is still there. Uh, the mantle and the torch is going to be passed. Um, you know, it's uh, 40 years for me uh, means that a lot of good friends have transitioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes you sort of take a look at your life and see what you've done. Mm -hmm. And um, and see how many uh, of young people you've mentored to keep the banner high. They're going to be new challenges, uh, serious challenges to ABCI maintaining its integrity. Uh, the multicultural movement is a major movement, mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly have contributed to promoting it. Yeah, but it uh, requires us to be responsive to the. Uh, New times. Yeah. And so I think one of the challenges of ABC is finding out um, <laughs> what what positions, what new goals uh, are going to be set for ABC in the future. And I think the most important one is to continue to nurture students, bring young people into the field. Wow. Well, you've done such exemplary work. I'm so proud to sit here and be able to um, interview you. Um, and walking down a path that you've really laid. So I thank you for the opportunity to do this. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your time. 
This is Leandra Clark. I'm at the Association of Black Psychologists 40th Annual Convention. I just had the honor of interviewing Dr. Franklin. Thank you.